so in this paper, I aim to do three things. Um, first, to use the material record to estimate the quantity and scale of some overseas trade activity in the southern Aegean between 700 and 500 BC. Uh, second, to use this same material data set to think about possible sea routes along which luxury and commodity products, um, words with uh, um, inverted commas around them, we'll come back to that later, um, along which luxury and commodity products, specifically marble sculptures and ceramics, might have been transported. Um, and to consider to what extent these luxury and commodity trade routes might have been entangled with one another. Um, and finally, third, to reflect on what this analysis suggests about the nature of trade and the economy of archaic Greece, again, other words with um, inverted commas around them. Um, the first part of this paper on luxury routes is based on a case study I explored in one of the later chapters of my PhD thesis. Um, and the latter part uh, on commodity routes builds on work from my PhD um, in a new study conducted as part of the expansion and revision of my thesis. Um, it represents a work in progress, and I am, of course, very grateful for any feedback you offer. Um, so I want to start not in the Aegean Sea, but in the National Archaeological Museum, um, specifically right at the start chronologically of the story of archaic freestanding male sculpture um, with the wonderfully austere Sunion Kouros um, and his fantastically square knees. Um, Kouros statues were, in a sense, luxury products. Alan de Puy has recently argued most convincingly that in the archaic period in the world of 700 to 500 BC, on which this paper focuses, there were no or at least very few aristocrats of hereditary lines, nor was this a world with an inherent class system. Yet there was a sense of eliteness that was felt throughout society, whereby to be elite was a temporary status that could be variously gained or lost. And so this world was inhabited by individuals constantly striving to achieve a level of eliteness, performing in order to generate status through public recognition, making references in speech or text to one's real or imagined ancestry by engaging in the symposium or in athletic events, through curating collections of rare or imported objects, or, as here, by conspicuously and performatively dedicating large, expensive, and prestige items in open, visible, and public spaces, such as religious sanctuaries. The Kouros statue, like the Sunyong Kouros, was in this sense a luxury product, in that it was something that was not put up by all kinds of people at all times. But the dedication of a Kouros statue conspicuously consumed wealth by an aspirational part of society trying to show off performatively to one another. But what this step, but what to, uh, can this statue itself tell us about its place in an ancient economy of luxury and about how the economy might have changed over time? Um, it has been dated variously to the start of the 6th century BC, between 600 and 580. It's at the start of a tradition of sculpted male figures displaying characteristics such as the archaic smile, the braided hair, and the left step that lead art historians to see the figure as the type fossil of the Sunyong group of Kouros sculptures. This is a marble statue manufactured from stone originating from the quarries on the island of Naxos, a white marble whose constituent grains are large and might also contain darker gray and black inclusions. The statue originally stood on the headland of the sanctuary of Poseidon at Sunion, one of a set that looked out towards the sea, both as a dedication given in honor of the god, but also visible as a monument to sailors marking their way towards Attica. Moreover, we observe how this freestanding male figure stands on top of a rectangular plinth, which, although perhaps uh, sculpted separately from the main statue itself, um, is a footprint for the original cuboid block of stone from which our statue was made. So standing at about three meters high, um, one would need a marble block of about 0.75 cubic meters um, to form this sculpture in the round in the way that we know these things were manufactured. Uh, which means, given the density of marble um, is around 2.7 tons per meters cubed, you would probably need uh, just over two tons of raw stone to make a sculpture like this. Um, these four points, I argue, are absolutely key to informing us about how this object fits into a wider system of trade in the archaic period, when the statue dates from, 
where the material for the statue originates, where the finished product ended up, and how much stuff was used in a product like this. These four things tell us about the chronology of processing and consuming raw materials. Moreover, they indicate that the large-scale production of Kouros statues was basically an economic activity, and that this luxury economy was embedded within the fabric of socio-cultural activities within archaic Greece. It was driven by the desire among aspirational elites to dedicate things conspicuously in order to generate status. And while a data set such as the corpus of Kouros statues has been traditionally looked at from the point of view of art history, it has the potential when used holistically like this to reveal much more about the ancient economy and about an economy of luxury manufactured products. And so in order to explore these issues of the macroeconomy of archaic Greece, um, this paper is not going to look at the characteristics of just one Kouros, like the Sunion Kouros, but across the Kouros data set. Um, so the database for study here, um, a freestanding sculpture, um, contains 10 complete Kouros statues, um, in addition to 14 whole draped female Korea statues. Um, there are also studied here 295 fragments of Koroi and 160 fragments of Korai, from which one can estimate the original size of a parent statue. And when I say fragment, um, I mean anything apart from a complete statue, so anything from a hand um, or torso, perhaps, to a whole statue that's just missing its head. Um, to go from a fragment to a full body, of course, requires some sort of ratio calculations. So, for example, the torso is about 35% of the whole body. So if a torso survives, we might um, scale that up. Um, and, of course, slightly different ratio calculations are required when dealing with different stylistic groups of choroi. The arm of the Melian group, for example, slightly larger than the um, Anavisos group in relation to the whole body size. So the height of each known chorus or chora has been plotted here with a nominal reconstructed height based on each fragment against both time and against marble um, provenance. And the categories for um, the fine spot of marble are plotted here as they are listed um, in the catalogues from which uh, the data were obtained. Um, however, this results in the rather odd juxtaposition of categories of place, such as Naxian or Pentelic, against color, um, blue, whitish, gray. And um, some colors of marble are more likely to have come from certain places, for example, perhaps blue marble from around Boeotia. Um, but as uh, this study was conducted as a bibliographic study, this did not permit reanalysis of the primary material, and the categories could not, could not be refined or combined further. Um, therefore, they have just been plotted as they were originally listed in the catalogues from which uh, data were sourced. So as you can see, uh, the Kouroi are generally up to two meters tall, but certainly before 550 BC, there's not an insignificant number of larger statues. Furthermore, the general trend is towards smaller statues over time. Evidence of colossal statues, those around the eight meter mark, dedicated on Naxos and Thelos, is provided by fragments, um, which are scaled up to a full body height. Clustering of data points suggests that, provided we are assuming consistent preservation conditions across time, the main fashion for producing and dedicating statues was around 550, um, but one must again be cautious that arbitrary dating um, to the mid-6th century might produce a false pattern. If we filter out um, a sort of noise created by um, statue data points of undetermined marble, we observe that there's a rough trend towards the use of Naxian marble in the first half of the 6th century and Parian in the second. Um, most of these statues are larger than life at two to four meters in height, and all other varieties of marble are represented in low numbers. There's some mild preference for Boeotian marble in the first part of the century and for Pentelic around 550 BC. And of the little uh, marble um, from Thassos plotted here, data points are likewise um, clustered around the 550 mark. Um, there is no statistically significant evidence for a correlation between the type of marble used and the height of a statue sculpted. Um, but in order to go back to the economy and trade routes more generally, we need first to consider the scale of production for sculpting these marble statues. Um, as we did above for the Sunion Kouros, 
we need to go from the height of the statue to the tonnage of the raw marble blocks. The heights for all surviving Koroi has already been given above, and in the same way that we move between height, volume, and tonnage, we can do the same for all of the data points. The density of stone for all these statues is the same, being 2.7 tonnes per metres cubed, as the standard for marble. Combining the data points yields a total median value of around 607 tonnes of raw marble that would have been required to sculpt all the statues that survive in the art historic record as collected in the database here. Crucially though, this is just the amount of stone required to manufacture surviving statues. Anthony Snodgrass and others after him have estimated that only about 1% of the total sculpture that was once made in the archaic period survives, a figure which may not be entirely accurate, but um, on reflection and after a little bit of experimental number crunching, seems at least to be in the correct order of magnitude. If there exists now in the material record 1% of the original sculptures that were once carved in the archaic period, we might estimate that there was something like 60,000 tons of marble quarried for the purposes of freestanding sculpture alone throughout the entire archaic period. Distributed across, say, 200 years of activity, this corresponds to something like 300 tons of marble quarried per annum for sculpture alone. However, we must also remember that an average figure like this simplifies the situation dramatically. Uncertainties of all sorts, environmental and weather-related, regional demands and preferences or availability of workforce would necessarily mean that some areas of the Aegean would variously exploit more or less marble at certain times throughout the 200 years or so of the archaic period. The resolution of the data set in terms of both quantity and quality is such that we cannot factor these elements into the overall model with any such accuracy on an Aegean wide scale, but it does um, give a sense or at least of a big picture view of what happens throughout the long durée of the archaic period, smoothing over perhaps these year-to-year -year variations and bumpiness. Um, there is, of course, evidence, in, as in the case of the colossal quarry on Naxos, that statues were roughed out at the quarry from which the stone was extracted, and thereafter sculptures were loaded onto ships, for example, to transport our original case study Kouros from Naxos to Sunion. The ship of choice in the archaic period for the transport of heavy freight, such as marble and loaded amphoras, is thought to be the Pentaconda, a fact which is communicated to us in both literary and iconographic sources. This was an oared ship with a crew of 50, and archaeological evidence suggests that the dimensions of the ship were in the region of 26 by 2 by 1.2 metres on the basis of the ship fundament found by German excavators on Samos. No shipwrecks of Pentacondas loaded with cargo have been found belonging to the Archaic period, and therefore calculation of the carrying capacity of these ships must be made on a comparative basis. The closest parallel we might want to draw is the Pabuch Burnu shipwreck, with its 10 to 12 metre hull found in the east part of the Aegean off the coast of Halicarnassus and dated by its cargo to the 6th century. This ship was, at the time it sank, carrying cargo comprising 200 amphoras from various Eastern Aegean workshops and other smaller fineware pottery. And this load tells us two things about the shipment of cargo in the Archaic period. Um, that, in this case at least, amphoras took up most of the space within a shipment, um, and second, that cargoes were mixed, probably comprising other items such as fineware pots and perishable goods. If a ship such as this, with hull half the length, could carry about 200 amphoras, we might expect that a pentaconda could carry around 400 amphoras, and that, if a full amphora had a mean weight of 30 kilograms, then the total carrying capacity of the whole ship might perhaps be in the region of 12 tons. This is not to say, though, that, the shipping, that when shipping marble, each pentaconda was loaded with 12 tons of stone. In fact, it's completely reasonable to suggest that marble would only ever have comprised a small load of a total shipment. Apart from any other reason, the density of marble is an issue. 12 tons of marble would be the equivalent of just under 4.5 meters cubed of stone. Unless this stone were cut up into much smaller blocks, i.e. rendering it useless for sculpting monumental statues, 
and this cargo would only occupy a small part of the ship's floor space. Given the length of time that voyages in the archaic period took and the risk involved, surely traders would have wanted to use as much of the available area of the ship as possible for loading mixed cargoes, and a cargo comprising solely marble blocks would therefore waste, if you will, much of the available shipping space. We might assume, therefore, that only about a quarter of a ship's total capacity was loaded with marble, around three tons. Um, but this is not a completely arbitrary estimate. There was no mass market for marble statues, and given that objects such as these were most likely made to order, there is little reason to believe that more than one statue would be transported at one time um, and be loaded onto a ship. Therefore, we might assume that the standard quantity of marble on mixed cargo ships was around um, the average weight of a single koros or kora unit, um, which falls around the three-ton mark. Assuming, therefore, that marble was a minority cargo, um, it can be calculated that of all ships circulating the Aegean, perhaps 100 or so per year were also partially engaged with the transport of heavy marble. This does not mean, however, um, that 100 shipments of marble were assembled, but rather that there were already hundreds of ships moving other cargo around the Aegean, on the basis, uh, on the basis of which the shipment of marble could piggyback. Um, and so it's not difficult to see that the Aegean was already a well-mobilized zone in terms of maritime transport by the start of the 6th century, when the mass export of marble freestanding statues really took off. This is an important point um, that I will return to in the second half of the paper, and it will form the basis of the next section of analysis. Um, but first of all, I'd like to move from shipping um, to shipping routes and try to reconstruct some of the patterns of maritime haulage that were opening up in the archaic period um, marble trade. So computational techniques have been used frequently over recent years to investigate issues of connection, route making, and travel on principally land-based areas. However, few methodologies pioneered are appropriate for specifically seascape environments. The most common technique employed for land routes um, uses cost surface modeling, a system that considers the obstacles within a landscape and calculates the path of least resistance between two given points. Obstacles are generally considered to be topographic, whereby landscapes, uh, whereby landscapes are represented by raster images whose grid cells correspond to slope values. Slopes of a steeper gradient are penalized by the model to a greater degree accounting for the extra effort required in traveling over the slopes of a continuous terrain. Variations on this approach, of course, exist. One might investigate all the paths possible from a given point instead of connecting two known points. Or one might be interested more in corridors of opportunity for movement rather than the path lines themselves. It is clear, though, that some sort of base layer is required. Um, and this, in most instances, um, can be represented um, by a digital elevation model, um, which, of course, is appropriate for land um, environments, but for which there exists um, nothing um, immediately available and comparable for seascapes. Um, the obstacles uh, in modeling maritime routes would have to be based on tidal and wind patterns. And given that these systems alter um, significantly seasonally, daily and even hourly, and in highly localized ways, no single rest base map <clears throat> can simulate shifting sailing conditions. Cost surface analysis could suggest a route between two points under specific types of wind or tide conditions, but it could not suggest, without very complex models, how this route should be adapted in different circumstances. Furthermore, it's inadequate to plot routes only between known ports. On the one hand, the location of harbours relative to rocky coastlines and headwinds, or their distance or visibility from other harbours, made certain places more or less accessible to one another. But on the other hand, it's also important to remember that ships also stop not infrequently at less formally designated anchorages and stopover points, either by choice or by necessity. Route modelling must consider that an actual destination is not always the same as an intended destination. In transporting heavy cargoes long distances by sea, 
um, Greeks sailed in shallow waters, hugging the coast and avoiding open waters. Even though ships of this period could sail in open waters, and for example, we have the uh, Phoenician ships sailing to and from Cyrene in the seventh century and beyond, um, road ships still tended to move via the coast. And this is exactly what the Pentaconda was and how we imagine it sailed. Coastal routes presented shoals and rocky waters, and this of course meant a certain degree of risk to sailors. They moved therefore via a series of short hops between the nearest available anchorages and across an even maritime landscape, the distance traveled was in some senses proportional to the number of intermediary anchorages passed en route. This sort of travel can be modeled computationally by using proximal point analysis or PPA. In a PPA, places are inherently connected in a network to others by virtue of geographic proximity. Places, i.e. harbors or potential anchorages, could be represented by nodes uh, as dots here, and the routes between these nodes um, represented by edges or the lines uh, between these dots. If we want to model the scenario of a ship going from a source marble quarry to a destination, where a marble statue is displayed, and if we take the assumption that the ship is going to be moving according to these rules of going the shortest distance possible between anchorages and along the coast, um, this is exactly what a PPA can easily simulate. So a PPA was built as a network model um, in the uh, network program GEFI, um, with anchorages around the Aegean visualized as nodes, and where each node was tied to its three nearest neighbors. Anchorages um, were used as the base unit of analysis here rather than formal harbors, as our knowledge of ancient harbors is undoubtedly incomplete. Um, and as I said before, it's um, entirely likely that ships would have stopped at non-formally designated harbors. Clearly not every anchorage, anchorage would be appropriate for the loading and disembarking of marble, at this, as this would require significant infrastructure. However, as the focus of this part of the study is on a more zoomed out uh, scale and concerned with route and route networks, and um, the actual loading and disembarking of marble is not considered. Um, so the nearest neighbor tool of the network software GEFI was used to suggest a route between any um, pair of nodes where the least number of intermediary nodes was passed from the source to target. Um, so here on the screen, um, the tool traces um, the computationally suggested um, nearest and quickest route between a pair of nodes selected, so the marble source Paros and the point of consumption um, at Olympia. Um, modeling movement in this way, of course, makes a number of assumptions. First, that ships always took the most direct routes from source to destination once they were loaded with marble cargo. Second, that these ships always navigated without question to the nearest anchorages, regardless of weather conditions. Third, that these routes between the site of a statue, uh, between the site of statue production and statue consumption would be fixed, and that routes would not be adapted depending on whether other cargo was gained or traded throughout the rest of the voyage. Each assumption takes the model into a more abstract environment, but doing so is in some senses necessary for investigating and um, the broadest level of connectivity at this sort. So source and target nodes were chosen to represent places of marble statue production and consumption. In some senses, consumption um, is easy to deal with. That's, um, in most cases, the fine spot of the Kouros or Kores statues. And um, production site is a little more difficult um, as we deal, of course, um, with variably uh, defined um, marble sources, as we saw before, the Naxian and Parian versus more broad categories like blue or island. Um, but this does allow us to identify to some degree marble sources for a significant number of items in the catalogue. So in this section, only statues whose provenance is known with some degree of accuracy are analysed. This reduces the data set to 207 sculptures. Statues whose provenance is known only as island marble have been analysed, but where a set of the data points randomly chosen have been reclassified as Naxian and the other um, as Parian. 
Although we have multiple quarries from each island, the provenance of the objects studied um, is accurate perhaps usually only to the level of the island, and so this is taken as the common denominator to which the data set is measured. Therefore, for each marble sculpture where the necessary information was available, a suggested route was calculated on the basis of the rules discussed above. These root lines were then collated and weighted in terms of the relative quantities of marble, um, which in the surviving material record at least, were transported along each route, i.e. the tonnage of marble taken from one specific quarry to another specific point of consumption, usually a sanctuary, as a proportion of all the marble which would have been moved around the Aegean. And that's indicated on these lines um, by color. So the green lines are the ones weighted with uh, lower quantities of marble, and the sort of yellow, orange, red ones are weighted in terms of greater quantities of marble. So this allows us to identify both paths and corridors, and I'll come to the latter of these in a moment. Paths are perhaps more easily understood when we look separately at the routes the model suggests one might take separately from Paros and Naxos, the two main exporters of raw marble in the Archaic period. High volumes of Naxian marble were imported east, particularly to Samos and Rhodes, and indeed more Naxian marble was used in the freestanding sculpture of the Eastern Aegean than stone from any other source. By contrast, Paros exported marble to a greater number of sites in Ionia and on the Dodecanese, um, but the weighted route lines indicate that this was in lower quantity than the exports of Naxos. The clients of both Naxos and Paros, who consumed the most marble sculpture, were Athens and Thelos. But while Parian marble was the main material of choice for the former, it was Naxian marble that was more frequently exported to the latter. Within the Cyclades, both islands exported to a range of different places, but notably, Naxos exported um, to Milos, even though Paros was geographically closer. To the north of the Cyclades, routes along the Straits of Evia served marble being shipped to central Greece, and analysis indicates that ships originating from Naxos might go this way. Furthermore, the main traffic away from both islands, both in terms of distinct number of routes, but also um, in the terms of the total weight of marble shipped, uh, went through the Saronic Gulf, both to sites in this area, but also through the Gulf, en route to sites along the Corinthian Gulf. The graph provided suggests that of the shipments from the Cyclades that came through the Gulf, those of Parian origin were more frequent. Indeed, Parian marble was used at Olympia, although not analyzed here in this study, um, and this would presumably have been shipped along this route. In terms of overall quantity, Naxos made shipments of a much lower number to a greater number parts of the Aegean, and Paris, by contrast, shipped higher volumes of marble to fewer destination sites. In particular, the most frequently used route for the export of marble connected Paros and Athens. Um, and here, um, I take a brief interlude just to say, this is, of course, um, only and very clearly part of the picture. This is a very macroeconomical overview that looks at only part of the whole process um, of the marble economy. Um, this doesn't take account of example, the cutting or roughing of stone, um, land transport, um, lifting of marble onto ships by cranes, or the personnel um, required at each stage. Um, as I say, this is a more broad overview study rather than specific case study analysis, and it's not meant to provide us with a definitive model to say this is how the ancient economy worked. Rather, it's meant to raise discussion, um, or at least um, I hope it will do, on whether this could or not be a plausible story um, in terms of the ancient economy. And of course, there are some um, computational quirks in a model like this, um, some of the more eccentric routes that you can see going um, both into the North Aegean and down towards Crete, but I decided to leave those in the graphic just to sort of um, highlight, in some senses, uh, how uh, this computational method um, renders its results. So at this scale of analysis, and given the quality of the data, the important thing is not the individual paths, um, but the route corridors, i.e. the general uh, corridors um, through uh, uh, the main corridors for the shipment of marble, where paths seem to point most regularly. 
We can identify here four main corridors of movement for the shipment of marble, all of which originate um, in the Cyclades. In order of increasing activity, these routes ran via the Dodecanese, through the Icarian Sea, along the Evian Straits, and one into the Saronic Gulf. Further model, uh, furthermore, uh, this model suggests that, as seen above, although these are the main corridors of movement, the actual shipping lanes out of the Cyclades depend on whether one originates in Naxos or in Paros. Specifically in heading to the Saronic Gulf from Naxos, the route goes via the Northern Islands, whereas from Paros one would head west. This suggests at least that in transporting marbles, it's not as simple as drawing a straight line from the Cyclades to the point of consumption, but it does matter the route uh, for the route which island one comes from. So what all four main corridors have in common is that they indicate the most efficient route, <coughs> the most efficient route of sailing from the main marble quarries on Naxos and Paros to points of Kouros consumption involves getting out of the Cyclades as quickly as possible. In all cases, the model used suggests that one is best placed to move um, straight towards the east-west paths that span the north coast of Kithnos, Syros, Mykonos, Ikaria, and Samos, or that nip along the north tips of Milos, Kimolos, Eos, and Amalgos. While this set of routes generated uh, somewhat at the touch of a button, um, and therefore we might not uh, wish to place too much immediate interpretive weight on them, there are, however, three key reasons um, wh why, I argue at least, one might choose to see some of these route corridors as historically valid. Um, first, these east-west corridors resemble routes described in what little literature of antiquity talks explicitly about navigation through the Aegean Sea. The Periplus of the pseudo Scylics is a sailing manual dated to the 4th century BC, possibly, but quite unlikely, making limited reference back to a Scylix of the 6th century BC. This text advises its readers to avoid sailing around the Cyclades and in navigating between the mainlands of modern-day Greece and Turkey to go the route just described before, from west to east along the north coasts of Kithnos, Syros, Mykonos, Ikaria, and Samos. This is the same route that would be described by Strabo four centuries later, and again by the second century AD otherwise anonymous Stadiasmus Maris Magni, the latter of which um, also describes the southern route via Milos, Kimolos, Eos, and Amalgos. Um, second, the locations of the major known harbours from the Cycladic Islands follow at least the conjectured routes. Um, the map here on the left indicates that the pattern works largely on an Aegean level scale, but a closer example focused on the island of Paros illustrates as such even more closely. The major quarries of the island are concentrated towards the centre of the island, and modern day sailing atlases and navigation charts indicate to us the anchorages on all sides of the island, um, all roughly equidistant from the quarries, are suitable for safe mooring. However, it was only towards the north of the island that major harbour settlements developed in the Archaic period. And if the known series of modern and early modern tracks can be used as in any way indicative of where roads might have been first built in antiquity and persisted, one would also observe how a dense network stretches from the quarries north towards these same harbours for the land-based transport of marble towards the coast. This is significant as these harbours point straight towards the east-west corridor. Launching raw marble north from the island rather than south is a more efficient way of getting the product quickly out of the Cyclades along those um, east-west corridors just identified. Third, even a random simulation model generates the same four corridors as those discussed above. It was discussed earlier that ships carrying marble for statue production would not necessarily, nor perhaps ever, go straight from place of source to destination. These ships were also carrying other cargo that they may want to uh, unload or trade en route, or the ships might variously be forced to adapt their routes based on unpredictable weather patterns. The output graphic here is based on a model that moves into hypotheticals in two ways. First, it looks at all statues in the art historic record, including those for which provenance information is not known and has randomly assigned a place of production. 
Second, while the start and end points of a route remain fixed, the ships travel um, to random adjacent nodes, rather than going necessarily to the node that would take them most directly to their intended destination. Um, this introduces an element of randomness, some might even say chaos, into the model. Yet even though um, these additional corridors are rend uh, even though additional corridors are rendered here, and notably as you can see along the north coast of Evia, along the coast of Ionia, and a branching of the corridor both north and south at the point between Tinos and Andros, despite the randomness in the model, the four main route corridors identified are still generated. So we might ask what these four route corridors actually represent. First, given what has already been discussed about ships transporting mixed cargo, and that we cannot be certain all of a ship's cargo took the same journey between the harbour from which raw marble was shipped and a destination sanctuary, we might consider that route lines here um, are only uh, fragments of routes, that they're route fragments. Trade routes for some other product shipped along, uh, alongside marble could have been much longer and the stage at which marble was transported might be a short section at the beginning, middle, or end of those journeys. But the part at which marble, materially durable and uh, ubiquitous in the archaeological record, perhaps more visible than some of those other, other products, um, is perhaps, as I say, the most uh, visible in an otherwise hard to define trade route. Um, second, these routes might also um, represent some of the mobility patterns of craftspeople um, not just or only uh, marble products. Um, there is evidence, of course, that artists traveled with marble. They roughed out marble at quarries, um, and particularly um, in areas where uh, non-local stone was used and local stone was available, we have evidence that um, artists were employed from far away uh, to uh, work on statues. Because of material quality, or because of, um, one might want to order a, speci a specific craftsperson, um, people would choose what stone they wanted uh, their work to be in. Um, and then, therefore, uh, craftspeople might travel alongside marble, and any, mobi any uh, mobility patterns generated here could tr help us to trace their individual movements. Third, given what has already been said about the scale at which the export of marble statues operated, that there were some hundreds of ships every year involved in the shipping of raw marble for the production of Kouros and Kouros statues, and that this trade was already so well established by the start of the sixth century BC, these route corridors most likely predated the actual marble trade, i.e. it was only because these shipping lanes were already set up that the trade of marble statues could begin so quickly at the start of the sixth century. Shipping around the Aegean Sea was already so well established in both range and intensity by the end of the 7th century BC that this new trade network could quickly piggyback on the existing network. And so the second part of the paper considers what evidence we have um, for some of these other trade routes off the back of which luxury trade might have benefited or, as I say, uh, piggybacked. In particular, I will consider here commodity trade and the extent to which ceramic evidence can be used to reconstruct, even partially, um, these sorts of overseas trade networks. So we know, of course, <clears throat> that all sorts of perishable goods were moved around the Greek world in the archaic period, from what Lynn Foxhall has called semi-luxuries, such as precious oils and textiles, to simple commodities like grain, oil, and wine. Furthermore, owing to an increased presence in the material record of proxy indicators such as transport amphoras, scholars have suggested that the rate of production of these goods also increased significantly over the course of the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Agrarian economies of the Archaic period created surplus beyond local needs, and excess produce was exported mainly by sea and traded around the Aegean. The distribution of ceramics is one of the best but perhaps most complicated sets of indicators for trade activity of perishable goods like these. There is no need to, re to rehearse here some of those complications. Consumption patterns do not necessarily mirror import patterns. 
While provenance and consumption might tell us about the start and end of a traded object's life, this says nothing about its part in a longer chain op operatoire of trade. Object use, reuse, and nature of deposition widen the interpretive gap between consumption and trade import patterns, and even the life of an object post-antiquity muddies the water as the quantity of objects obtained, studied, and published, or at least accessible in databases, might not be representative of real or ancient patterns. And of course here, um, I will note that um, luxury and commodity are of course our own labels, and they are in some senses um, reductionist. It's not to say that ancient people would have seen these kinds of trade activities in these terms. And of course, even a commodity can become a luxury in a given scenario, if it is, for example, imported from uh, very far away from a non-local environment. So I'm not using um, these labels um, didactically, but in a sense, heuristically, um, for our own benefit, for the benefit of the historian, to try and conceptualize systems of macroeconomy. Um, so nevertheless, despite these problems, the ceramic data set of the 7th and 6th centuries BC has the advantage that it has been of major interest and the subject of much study by art historians for at least the past 150 years. Substantial detailed and careful work on the relative chronologies and regional sequences of fineware ceramics has been high on the agenda of classical archaeologists and art historians, with the result that a very large, well-studied, and published data set already exists. The categories of art historians, the workshops and places of production identified, may not be as precisely defined as one might be able to obtain now through scientific methods, but they are, for the large part, broadly accurate. So even though, as I say, they may not be precise, they are at least accurate, and I'll come back to the distinction and categorization later. Therefore, they might be, uh, ceramics might be used to identify patterns at this sort of scale. Indeed, Robin Osborne has argued previously and convincingly on the basis of the distribution of various attic finewares, mainly in Etruria, that there was possibly a targeting either by the consumer or by the producer of different types of vessels, that there was a specialization in the consumption of certain pottery types in certain places. Again, these notions of specialization and product targeting are prudent to the question of the ancient economy and need to be unpacked further. Um, so within uh, my PhD study, um, I conducted an analysis on 22,307 fineware vessels and looked at the pottery consumption patterns of this data set, um, data drawn principally um, from 30 published catalogues of 16 sites, giving a cross-section across the southern Aegean um, with diachronic resolution. The points of interest were place of consumption, i.e. where the pottery vessel or sherd studied came from, and the shape of the original vessel, where known, and the wear of the ceramic roughly defined. Where possible, the source data were also apportioned um, to the rough categories of sanctuary um, versus urban context. So as discussed above, the ceramics from various different parts of the Aegean um, were studied with different levels, uh, sorry, have been studied with different levels of intensity. Even though we might be able to distinguish even intrasite uh, ceramic workshops for some parts of Greece, the precision of our knowledge might be regional and broad, broad brush at best in others. And so we must work with data at, um, of a common denominator in order to make ceramic evidence from a large geographical region comparable. In practice, this means resorting to rather coarsely defined um, and by some uh, standards quite uh, lumpy and generalizing categories such as Attic, Corinthian, or Ionian. Um, yet the stylistic differences between broadly defined ceramic categories such as these are distinct enough um, that we know that these are at least very reliable categories, imprecise though they may be, um, and also accounting for different uh, precision of chronological dating of the ceramics studied. Um, each object was put into one of four more broadly defined chronological time slices, 700 to 650, 650 to 600, 600 to 550, and 550 to 500 BC. So the data set was analyzed via a clustering algorithm using principal component analysis, 
with an initial bootstrap of the data. Bootstrapping allows one to assess the accuracy of a data set through randomly sampling values from the data set, replacing with dummy values and measuring the changes in the distribution generated. So there is an inbuilt test in this methodology to assess the strength or validity of any patterns identified. I will not focus on the uh, methodology of the analysis here, but rather on the implications of the results. So analyzing the place of consumption versus the roughly defined where indicated that locally produced ceramics supplied the demand of pottery for urban sites. But for sanctuary sites, there was less correlation between the geographic position of a site within the region and its consumption of regional potteries. Kalana was notable for the predominance of Ionian ceramics in its assemblage from an early date, as were Sunion and Thoricos with regard to Corinthian ceramics. One can also note the presence of Corinthian eriboloi on Rhodes and Thelos. Many of the patterns have previously been noted on a case-by-case -case basis in the commentaries of each assemblage catalogue, but what is new is that in synthesising these data, the pattern is remarkably consistent. Ceramics were produced locally and circulated locally unless there was some specific need to look further afield to different markets, and demand for specific types of vessels was greater in the 6th century than in the 7th century. So a similar pattern emerged upon analysing place of consumption versus shape of ceramic. Urban sites consumed a wide range of ceramics, but different sanctuary sites had preference for certain shapes. Colonna is exceptional as a sanctuary in having fewer Hydriae and Eribaloi than other sanctuaries, but more Kilikes, while the same in Harion, for example, is notable for its number of craters, Chios for its Oinokui, Lindos and Sunion for their Eribaloi, and Smyrna for the combination of Eribaloi and Pixides. Indeed, one might go as far to say that sanctuary sites were in some senses specialised in their consumption of various ceramics, and uh, this is a pattern that, at least in this case, is statistically significant. Um, and this is the main takeaway from this section of analysis, um, that the pattern, consistent across a large data set in both space and time, analysing both wear and shape as units of analysis, is that there um, seems to be evidence for a specialised consumption of various ceramics in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. If cluster analysis reveals specialization of sites consuming certain types of ceramics, we have at least three options. First, that this is a random pattern created by the publication bias of certain site catalogues for ceramics of given wares and shapes. Or second and third, that this is a real pattern and there was targeting of certain ceramics by certain consumers. Or conversely, this is a real pattern and there was a targeting of certain ceramics by certain producers. We can, I think at least, discount the first alternative with some degree of confidence. For this, we must refer back to the long history of study on the data set. While we might not trust the source publications to represent accurately the true distribution of, say, fine wares versus medium wares versus coarse wares at a site, study on fine wares alone has been intensive enough and extensive enough that one might take perhaps a leap of faith to say that the published data set we have is at least fairly representative of broader patterns of fineware types and shapes um, to some degree, as I say, of accuracy, if not precision. Second, the pattern is strong enough and consistent enough across all publications analysed that this could not just be an anomaly from one or two publications. In big data approaches such as these, there are, of course, irregularities and anomalous data points, but keeping the analysis broad enough at a high enough scale of analysis serves to smooth over the fluctuations and give a good sense of the general pattern over time. Third, there is the element of statistical adjustment and a test for significance built into the analysis conducted, as I noted before, um, the bootstrap method um, built in uh, uh, as a statistical measure um, right in the start of the analysis, um, such that anomalous, anomalous patterns are smoothed over and the patterns that remain can be viewed with a certain degree of confidence. Whether we choose option two or three, one of the same implications is true. Specialization relied on the sharing of knowledge between producers and consumers. In order for market specialization to operate, 
Either producers knew what consumers wanted, or consumers knew what producers could offer, or perhaps a mixture of both. Economic targeting relied on the circulation of knowledge of people's needs, perhaps to a greater degree than has been traditionally considered for the archaic period. The implication of a system of specialised and targeted commodity trade is twofold. First, this runs somewhat contrary to the macro scale and Aegean level picture of the archaic economy advanced, um, first of all, by Anthony Snodgrass almost 40 years ago. Um, in a similar paper to um, the first half of my own that analysed the bulk shipping of marble by C in the Archaic period, Snodgrass argued that the ancient economy used local labour and resources as far as possible, and he actually refused to refer to the process as trade because there was, in his view, a lack of anonymity between supplier and customer. Um, this model has persisted somewhat in the scholarship of Archaic Greece, despite more recent revisions and criticisms of the model by, among others, Robin Osborne, Lynn Foxhall, Mark Laval, and Alain Bresson. As was indicated above, the consumption of ceramics in both the 7th and 6th centuries was not local, in the sense that ceramics from neighbouring regions were uh, regularly imported in large quantities and consumed. It was not just a case of taking whatever was available nearby. On the second point, while the present analysis does not make the case for a personal and direct relationship between consumers and producers, systems of specialization and product targeting, such as those suggested by the above results, cannot operate if there is a total anonymity between supplier and customer. The whole principle hinges around the circulation of a shared knowledge. Furthermore, if the distribution of ceramics is not totally random, commodity shipping routes were not completely random either. Products were manufactured in specific places with the intention of delivering to specific places. Um, there may have been intermediary stops en route. Uh, this specific voyage might have been just a fragment of a much longer journey, but at the macro scale at least, there is some merit in exploring again shipping routes between places of production and places of consumption. And so we return again to the PPA model, using this time ceramic assemblages, their places of production and consumption, as the unit on which to base the route lines. As indicated above, analysis of fine wares to the level of broad and imprecise categories such as Attic or Corinthian does not permit us to draw lines from specific places of production. Rather, we need to trace routes, uh, route lines from a general Attic or Corinthian area to the place of consumption. Ionian as a category is a little more difficult to deal with, as recent work, both typological and scientific, has indicated the existence of a number of major production centers in the eastern part of Aegean. Um, for example, the recent uh, neutron activation analysis of Villing and Monson has indicated um, major production workshops um, on costs for ceramics, which were originally thought to um, come from roads. Um, yet much of this work is difficult to filter back um, into the big data analysis and back to source publications without complete restudy of all of the material. So the solution proposed in the PPA model is to distribute Ionian ceramics between a, a number of known major production sites on Lesbos, Chios, Samos, Kos, and Rhodes, and um, with other workshops active on the mainland between Miletus and Clasomenae. And um, this is similar to when I handled um, island marble before and distributed the data points between Naxos and Paros. Distributions are produced for both the 7th and 6th century that are very similar qualitatively. Both maps show major route corridors moving east-west, one that cuts through Evia and Andros, another that goes north of Kithnos, Syros and Mykonos, another south of Syros and Mykonos, and a final corridor along the southern border of the Cyclades. The weighting of the corridor units is similar in each graphic, suggesting that there could have been a similar intensity of shipping activity between the east and west sides of the Aegean Sea between the 7th and 6th centuries. The only notable difference is a preference in the 6th century for routes that go along the south of the Cyclades. 
So it's been suggested that the intense shipping activity of the 6th century BC that constituted the luxury trade uh, network of marble statues was already well established by the start of the century and that this cargo piggybacked on ships already transporting other goods. When the results of the marble PPA are laid over the top of the ceramic results from the 7th century BC, there becomes an even more compelling case to push this story. Three of the four major trade routes um, identified by the marble PPA align closely with those of the ceramic PPA. Moreover, we saw before how most of the marble traffic would likely have traveled along the north edge of the Cyclades, and this aligns perfectly with major potential ceramic uh, commodity routes of the 7th century BC. The implication here is that it was the scale and intensity of existing trade routes at the end of the 7th century BC that allowed luxury products to be exported so quickly at the start of the 6th century. These ships were already transporting commodity products in ceramic vessels, for example, all over the Aegean. And as these ships comprise mixed cargo, it was easy enough, once the dedication of marble statues became fashionable in the 6th century, to take those existing ships and add marble units to their existing cargoes. Commodity and luxury products variously served uh, different customers and were consumed in both the same and in different places, but the export of each product from regional products to non-local environments relied on transport networks that were intrinsically entangled with one another. Simply put, it was the pre-existence of certain types of shipping routes, um, referred to loosely here as commodity routes, that enabled the rapid development of other sorts of trade routes for luxury goods at the start of the 6th century BC. So in this paper, I've aimed to shed light on the scale and spatial pattern of uh, broadly defined luxury and commodity trade routes in the Archaic period. As discussed, um, these categories are somewhat generalizing labels, heuristic for helping us to sort the data um, even if they do not uh, map onto or define precisely um, the nature of trade in antiquity. What this categorization has aimed to do is to show that there were different levels of economic network um, in operation throughout the Archaic period and that they were entangled with one another to various degrees. The results of the marble study indicate that there existed in the 6th century an extensive network for the export of raw stone and worked sculpture. This depended on a pre-existing network for the transport of commodity goods, such as, for example, for the uh, trade of grain, oil, or wine, on which the export of prestige goods could piggyback. This implies not only that there was an organized interregional econo uh, economic network in place by the end of the 7th century, but also that those who participated in it had good knowledge of one another, one another's needs, and one another's preferences. Extensive planning on the level of those trading was necessary to organize a system of proto-market trade. There must have been significant infrastructure in place at a number of key nodal harbors around the Aegean, with a great number of ships engaged in this network, physical remains of which remain to be uncovered. The mobility simulation indicated that, even with the simplifications made and assumptions taken, the export of these, single, uh, of these single products connected various parts of the Aegean in a number of ways. Places that both produced and received marble and ceramics were directly connected with a network of other clients and customers. Furthermore, by virtue of the sailing routes in the Aegean, certain places not even involved in the actual production and consumption of these major products were highly integrated into this network, as ships would have passed by, possibly stopping over on the way. Notably, we've seen how high volumes of traffic um, flowed through the Saronic Gulf and along the northern Cyclades. Once this network was well established, it could be exploited in other ways, for example, for the transfer of uh, various types of technical knowledge um, or in communications between uh, states in terms of alliance or rivalry. As mentioned, there are four directions I would uh, as I mentioned, this is a work in progress, and there are four directions I would particularly like to move this research uh, next. 
um, both to test further the plausibility of the model and to develop the narrative that has begun to emerge. Um, first, to tally the results of this theoretical exercise against shipwreck evidence. Um, there are a few published sh shipwrecks originating in the Aegean Sea that date to the Archaic period, um, but those that have recently come to light, for example, off the coast of Fournee, indicate that this region of the Eastern Aegean, as also suggested by the PPA model, um, was a significant crossroads of maritime traffic. Second, to build into the model further complexity that could account for the relative importance of major ports and trade hubs around the Aegean. It has been discussed that significant infrastructure would be required for the processing, lifting, and transport of marble units between quarry and port, and this infrastructure would not be available at every anchorage. Similarly, there would be known emporia and various nodes around the Aegean Sea at which more formalized trade exchanges would have taken place. At the moment, the PPA gives every node the same priority, and it would be good to add another layer to the system where the ships um, are more likely to gravitate towards these certain major harbors than just to circulate somewhat randomly as they do at the moment. Third, it will be possible to refine the start and end points defined in the model as further research is undertaken on the provenance of target units and as more precise data becomes available. Finally, it would be worth extending the analysis beyond the small pond of the Southern Aegean. This region represents only a fragment of the much larger trade network that cuts across the Mediterranean. Moving from an Aegean scale to a Mediterranean scale would shed further light on how different sorts of trade routes interacted with one another. Through the present analysis, the scale and extent of some aspects of the maritime trade network of Archaic Greece have been estimated. In particular, I've argued that it was down to a shared knowledge between Greeks in various places that facilitated the formation and operation of luxury and commodity networks. These markets were separate and distinct, but they relied on one another. Luxury trade routes formed on the back of commodity trade routes, and the pre-existence of one allowed for the rapid development of the other at the end of the 7th and start of the 6th centuries BC. Thank you. <laughs>